Hi, hey, it's me, John Stewart. What's happening? Welcome to the future, motherfuckers. We're streaming live. This is this is the future. We're gonna we're gonna be streaming live. We got guests, and we're gonna be taking your questions live. This is incredible, or as we used to call it, uh, radio. <laughs> I don't know. What uh the uh march 3rd on apple tv plus the problem with john stewart's coming back we got six episodes we're very excited about that tonight uh we're going to be taking a calls uh, you can call us at 712-566-7839 or john 712 john stew i guess stew beef was taken i don't know if it was taken or not uh oh shit well you know what we're going to test this right off the top we're going to take a call just to make sure this works we got uh, a fellow by the name of david from chicago is gonna <laughs> hi is gonna, how are you are you are you david i'm david nice to talk and are, to you. are you from chicago yeah chicago area david let me ask you a question how does yeah. it feel to step into the future <laughs> this shit is happening uh, david like a, happening that's that's right i feel like i'm in a delorean you are in a DeLorean, my friend. Uh, what, what, what is your question to show that we are taking questions? Excellent. Well, thank you for taking my question. My real question is, um, with all the time you spent debating Mr. Papa O'Reilly, <clears throat> you know, in air conditioned theaters and stuff, I guess what I really want to know is, does this settle the debate of that he came from Bullshit Mountain? I mean, with this Fox defamation lawsuit and all that stuff going on, did you win the debate? David, first of all, it's an excellent question, and thank you for asking it. The question is, uh, did with the uh, Fox defamation case and all the things that came out proving that they are in uh, an in incipient, terrible fraud perpetrated upon the people, did I win my debate with Bill O'Reilly? Here's the only thing. I don't like to speak ill of the dead, uh, as we know O'Reilly <laughs> four or five years ago so i don't but i would say if he were here today if he were still with us <laughs> i would i would say david yeah motherfucker. that's I right would. well david thank you so much for calling and proving that point uh but we're going to get into we got a lot of stuff to get to in terms of the market in terms of stocks i'm going to bring in uh our two guests we got dave lauer who, as you know, is the CEO of Urban Finance and uh, has the We the Investors Movement. We also have David Dan, editor of American Prospect. Gentlemen, welcome. Hey, John. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks uh, for this entry into the future. Yeah. Guys, I can't even, by the end of this, my guess is we are all going to have personalized jetpacks. <laughs> and we're Sounds gonna about be, right. And we're going to be flying around. All right. Here's, here's where I want to start. Uh, the SEC has introduced a spate, spate, I tell you, of, of new rules, trying to get a handle on, on being more transparent, uh, trying to get a handle on lit markets, unlit markets, bringing a little bit of fairness, bringing some transparency, trying to get a hold of PFOF. I'm gonna jump in and tell you guys, I, I, Dave Lauer, I'd like you to go through a couple of the rules that you think are most crucial. I'm gonna jump in and say, I am a skeptic. Uh, the amount of hoops that have to be jumped through before any of these regulations uh, pass any kind of muster seem extraordinarily high. And I think they're just going to wait the SEC out until a, a new chairman comes in. But Dave Lauer, tell me what uh, some of these new uh, recommendations are to control the markets. Tell me which ones have the most promise and, and tell me which ones you believe will fall by the wayside. Sure. And, uh, you know, thanks for having me and thanks for covering this. I, I agree. It's a it's a spate of new rules, 1600 pages of rules. Um, have you read all 1600 pages? Unfortunately, read. Yeah. Um, I My life is not nearly as exciting, I think, as yours. Um, I just sit around watching The Last of Us. So right. <laughs> uh, and the, the rules themselves are relatively simple. They're very tiny parts of these proposals the the economic analysis and the 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 um, you know the justification uh, based on the law and the sec's mandate makes up 
the majority of it because as you i think rightly point out the sec knows that they are going to get sued so even if this process goes as smoothly right. as possible uh, they propose the rules. There's a th- about a three-month comment period, which ends at the end of March, and we are going to be running a comment letter campaign, and we're going to fill those comment files with mm-hmm. comments from individual investors, as we have in the past. Um, and these rules will, if they were to pass and go into effect, would really significantly transform markets. They would disintermediate a lot of firms. They would okay. make markets more efficient. They would increase competition. They would ensure that uh, individual investors and institutional investors are able to find each other, which is going to be, which would be a big change. Um, and and, it, and, and know, it would level the playing field, supposedly. Would, yes. So for, there, for today there, it, there are a set of rules because the rules today were written by retail brokers, internalizers. Bernie Madoff mm-hmm. had huge influence on these think- rules. Why wouldn't yeah, he? Yeah. Why wouldn't he? Of course, right? Well, yeah. this this gets to the point. So the you know it really goes to that. Uh, David Dan, I think one of the interesting things about this filing, and I think Dave Lauer uh, pointed it out, is there's a few rules, but they're 1,600 pages. A lot of this is data driven, and I'll tell you one particular point that jumped out at me. All we have heard about payment for order flow, and the reason why these billions of dollars have to flow to Citadel and and all these other companies is that is price improvement. Boy, the price improvement that you get as a retail investor, it's just shockingly wonderful, having nothing to do with uh, the tick or whatever else it's going. The data seems to counter that argument uh, and suggest that is, in fact, the opposite. Uh, Have you looked into any of these new rules and, and what are your thoughts on these types of things? Well, uh, I mean... I, I would start by saying I, I think it's uh, amusing that we're having kind of this freak out now uh, around this. This is going to sound off topic, but I swear it's on topic uh, about <laughs> no problem about about chat GPT and like AI and these bots mm-hmm. that are going to take over cr- all creative industries whatsoever. And the funny thing is that we kind of already have that in our markets. I mean, we have algorithms that do the vast majority of trading. Uh, and 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 no, with 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 very little participation uh, from from retail investors in many cases. And uh, this is sort of uh, you know if you had a fear of uh, AI that was uh, going to you know uh, put people out of work or uh, uh, you know it doesn't have to be a bad thing necessarily, right? It could be a leisure uh, uh, creating exercise, but. In this case, this is this is sort of how not to do it. The way in which the, the in the past couple decades, since technology has really taken over our markets, this mm-hmm. is this is kind of the what not to do yeah. uh, portion yeah. of this. And the SEC uh, rules represent an opportunity uh, to get back. It's great to hear from from Dave that uh, there's going to be you know a, a mass campaign to to make their voices heard because I mean so right. often in this process of implementing rules uh it's dominated by special interests i mean most of the time almost 90 percent 99 percent of all comments usually come from those in the know and uh, they're the ones who have the ability to walk in the door uh at the sec and uh you know just get inside the heads of and lobby and lobby congress as well yep Lobby yeah. Congress and and get them to also put pressure on on SEC commissioners and things like that. So it's so it's great to hear that they're going to be involved in the process, and I I think that's all to the good. Dave Lauer, how confident are you that that the retail investor is going to have a seat at that table? Because and how much of this is just a formality that they're going to do a three month comment period? But they're really look. God bless the SEC for trying, I guess. But as it shows, the only people they've been able to go after so far, are Kim Kardashian and Martha Stewart. I mean, you know, they don't seem well, they to don't want have, to take They don't on, even have money for coffee, John. I mean, they don't know, even have money for coffee, but they don't seem to take on powerful interests very often. You and know, I appreciate I, that they're putting on these these rules. But uh, which rule do you think has the best shot at at changing the dynamics of a skewed market? So, you know, these these rules are going after probably the most powerful firms in the industry. So I, I really got to say, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for 
the chair's office and what he's trying to do with these rules. He is, mm -hmm. I've, I've seen the SEC through many different administrations, and he is the first one who's come in and is willing to take them on. Will it be successful? It's really hard to say. I think the most impactful rule would be what's called the order competition rule, which says that no yes. longer retail brokers can no longer just send all their orders to Citadel and Virtu. They have to expose those orders on a lit market to open competition. Transparency. Um, I, Correct. You know, get get it on the lit exchange, get it out of the, the, the dark markets, get it, an end payment for order flow. Um, and Dave, and why not just why not just kill dark markets? It seems not? like they're taking a very indirect uh, pathway by saying, well, we've got a new competition rule of transparency. Why not just come and say everything's got to be lit? I, you know, I agree with you. We've been pushing the SEC for that. We've been saying this is way too overcomplicated. Just put in a trade at rule, just like they have in Canada, just they, like they have in the UK, just like they just passed in Singapore. Very simple. And mm -hmm. it's, it, it doesn't, it takes two sentences. It's literally a two sentence rule. Um, and we're going to push. Look, I think we have an opportunity. These are mm -hmm. initial proposals. We were talking to Gary Gensler yesterday. And we have had a seat at the table. Retail investors, individual investors now have a seat at the table. Okay. And we've established ourselves that Citadel and Virtu and Robinhood and Schwab do not represent individual investors. They represent their own profits, their own revenue, their own annual bonuses. And I think we've really completely changed that narrative. And so, you know, I think the, what the chair said was, these are our initial proposals. If you have better ideas, if you can justify them, put them mm -hmm. in the comment letter. I believe he's he's being honest. We've talked to other SEC commissioners who are receptive to this. So, you know, I think that this is the biggest opportunity in 17 years since Reg NMS was passed to change the rules of the market. And, you know, it's it's a long process, though, that but that's 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 how the law works. It, you know, he is beholden right. to the Administrative Procedures Act. They, they have to put the proposal out, comment, then they're going to adopt the rule. And then they're going to get sued, right? These firms are going to sue them. So if you don't think he's taking on powerful firms, you have to explain why they're going to sue him to prevent these rules from coming into place. Because, you know, this is going to right. save retail and institutional investors three and a half billion dollars a year just off this mythical price improvement that is not price improvement. And well, if, it, not if, if these rules execution. are going to save three and a half billion dollars for investors every year, then that just shows this is a system that is toxic. Uh, and, and has to change at some point. And, and David Dan, perhaps the idea would be then, let's see where the biggest pushback is, because uh, wherever the largest pushback is on the rules, you can probably lay a pretty clean bet that those are the rules that are going to have the greatest impact towards fairness and transparency. I, I don't think it's going to take too long for you to figure out where the biggest pushback is going to be. I mean, it's going to be from <laughs> Citadel. It's going to be from Virtu. It's it's going to be from these market makers who uh, take an incredible amount of income out of the system. And, uh, you know, uh, so we, are, we already know where the problems are. The problem is they're also, you know, that money uh, connotes uh, power and uh, they have that. And uh, they're going to use the court system to try to use that to their advantage. They're going to use the comment period to their advantage. And, and uh, we'll see where it ends up. But I think I think Gensler is making an attempt. I mean, I don't think I don't think this comes out of Jay Clayton's SEC. I don't think this comes no. out <laughs> of out of out of even uh, Obama's uh, SEC no, commissioner. Certainly Mary not. Shapiro I mean, we've, people like that. So we've been talking. You know, I mean, I think you got to get in there. Yeah. Well, there you go. And, and right. it's going to come from Congress, too. You know, I, I saw, David, your, your recent article on crypto, and you talked about uh, McHenry and Huizinga, and they're leading the charge against this. They are publishing op-eds oh, yeah. uh, against this. They're in the pocket of, you know, these firms, just like, uh, you know, they're in the pocket of these crypto firms. So you're suggesting that uh, there may be some congressional interests that are in the pocket of these larger <laughs> uh, interests. It's the first time hearing about it. And I, mean, I, 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 I hope you can thing. see the shock. I don't know if you can it's see it. I got my glasses. It's an it's, obscure dynamic. You see, I got the little, yeah. that's a, I got a circle light for the first time. So I'm Yay. very excited about that. You know why I have a circle light? I'm an influencer. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we got ourselves a, a call here from uh, Ross from Virginia Beach. He's a market maker. Uh, uh, or no, he's not a market maker. He wants to know if a market maker. Hey, Ross, are you there from Virginia Beach? Yep, I'm here. Ross, ask your question to Dave and David, and then I'll answer it because I'm the expert. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, my question was about failures to deliver um, or FTDs, which sure. someone can 
you know, um, take someone's money and not deliver the shares that they are owed. Well, listen, we're, th and this is going to get us into the MMTLP, which, you know, is mm -hmm. the Internet is a fire with MMTLP. But I, I don't know if you're talking specifically about that case, Ross, or do you just mean in general uh, when people are delivering, you know, I guess th this would also fold into naked shorts and people uh, selling preferred shares that they don't have and then not delivering them to once they do there. Is, is that sort of the general idea, Ross, or are you talking more specifically? Uh, generally speaking, generally. Uh, D Dave, you want to you want to take that on in terms of the FTDs uh, and and how those are going to be affected. Yeah, um, and that was it was actually the first question that we asked uh, Chair Gensler yesterday um, in our Q and A. It's something that everyone in in the the online investor community really cares about, and and you know what what's happening is as Ross said, uh, you go to buy a stock and. Uh, in your broker, it says you own that stock, mm -hmm. um, but whoever sold it to you fails to deliver those shares. It's very antiquated from when paper certificates were actually being delivered. Um, now, there are legal fail to deliver. So uh, firms like Citadel and Virtu claim what's called a bona fide market maker exemption to reg show, and they don't have to have a locate when they sell you shares. Um, and that is the Bernie why, Madoff Why exemption. would they? Why? why that, yeah. Why would you need to be able to locate the share you're selling? People? Imagine, right? Yeah, it makes no sense. And there's a really there's a huge problem in in this rule in that there are loopholes to it. So in theory, you have to eventually deliver. You have to get bought in if you don't deliver. Uh, but there are ways that that these firms use to kick the can down the road uh, through manipulation or loopholes. They use options contracts. They they use other other means uh, to shift it. They use what's called right. X clearing. It gets complicated, but what it comes down to is they sell something that they don't own. Uh, even Gary Gensler admitted it's, uh, according to their statistics, it affects 1% of all stock transactions. I've seen other numbers that say 3 to 5%. And I've well, seen shit, other numbers. Even 1% would be. A, even 1% would be an too outrageous much. amount. Yes. I mean, that's, you know, that's a multi trillion dollar fraud. Right. Right. It, it's really crazy, especially in a modern electronic marketplace. It doesn't right. make any sense anymore. Um, and so, you know, these are some of the reforms that we're pushing for. But I agree. FTDs are a huge problem. Um, and it's it's a really it's a flaw in markets that if people can if, if these firms can continuously fail and never deliver, you think you have your these shares, you don't. And it also inflates the float of companies. So what it, it creates extra well, it's a way for them to generate capital. I mean, right. they can they can generate a tremendous amount of capital and maybe that gets us into uh, w without. Uh, and thank you so much, Ross, for for checking in with us. Uh, I want to go out to Jimmy Ray from. Uh, I'm going to fuck this up. Mendocino. Is that correct? California. Yeah. Jimmy Ray. Can anybody hear me? Oh, Jimmy, we can hear Jimmy. Your voice is coming through <clears throat> the dulcet tones, my friend. You sound like Johnny Cash <laughs> coming out of Folsom. Sorry about prison. that. I had, to, I had to clear my throat. Please. Oh, man. Um, so, um, Mr. Stewart, yes, uh, Mendocino County, California. Yes, sir. The green emerald, the, the green triangle. Uh, the question that I have is, are you aware of a situation whereby a ticker that, tra that uh, formerly traded under the symbol MMTLP yeah. uh, recently went private? Yes, they, they, they flipped it. And now they trade under. It's basically the same company under a different name. It's like when they switched Darren's on Bewitched. Uh, really the inverse of that. No. Uh, it's the same company, they no. just changed the name. Well, what happened is the company actually went private Correct. and the shareholders still don't have their shares and they That's right. were not allowed the opportunity to liquidate their positions in the two That's days right. prior to when they were supposed to. And, and this is, I assume you're talking about, and, and I believe FINRA halted the trading on it. And uh, there's apparently yes. 65,000 or so uh, shareholders out there who are left kind of holding the bag on a company <laughs> that flipped from public to private. David uh, Day, and do you know something about this? I, I think those shareholders are all in the chat, like every single one. <laughs> they, they, they do that, yeah. <laughs> We're an army them. and we come I mean, on strong. Yeah, I mean, the, Dave, now, Dave, this is an example me, of... of is that Andrew? Dave spoke to me two days ago. Oh. Hi, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, beautiful. So, so, and we have a little thing, MMTLP is a crime scene. So listen, 
I've read about this case. It does seem awfully strange uh, that a public company can uh, decide to go private, get preferred share prices. Some of them, as you said, without the transparency of knowing if somebody really, if it was naked shorting or whatever it was, and suddenly That's now- exactly what we believe it was. And, and now there's a, a failure to deliver, and you've got a ton of people yeah. who, who grab something at, and I, I think it was maybe $12 a share at one point, and now it's just- Yes, sir, it was. It's it's evaporated. So, Jimmy Wright, let, I'm going to put the question to, to Dave Lauer, and thank you so much for that call, Jimmy. Uh, Dave, Dave Lauer, you know, look, I don't want to say there's always fire where there's smoke, but geez, there's an awful lot of smoke here. And and even if it's not the thing that everybody thinks it is, a market without transparency on that uh, makes it very plausible that something awry is going on. Yeah, you know, look, it's a terrible situation. There's no way around it. A lot of um, individual investors have been hurt by this and they're angry and I I understand that and I and I hate to see it. There's honestly there's like there's nothing worse uh to see than than this situation. Um I unfortunately don't think the explanation is as sort of cut and dry as they do. And you know, I that doesn't mean that I'm right about it, but from my perspective, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what what happened was that there is a mistaken understanding that they were going to have more days to trade this stock. And part of it is based on the complexity of these systems and the complexity of what are called corporate actions. And, you know, the, anyone in the industry who would have seen the, the action that explained this going private transaction would have said, yes, trading is going to end on this day. Um, but because the company uh, was not clear about that and uh, online there was a lot of misinformation, people thought they were going to have two more days. Fine. It, FINRA stepped in and halted the stock because once it spun off the private company, the rights to that private company were no longer carried by that symbol and that symbol ceased to have value. And so to have allowed it to trade for those two days would have mean that there was nothing being traded. Now they hate me. They hate me when I say this. And I, <laughs> it's, it's honestly, it, I, I hate to have to say it because I don't want to be the target of all this online abuse, but Bes you know, that's beside but, but the Dave, fact that there are back a little bit though. bad things so, happening here. I understand. Sure. But and FINRA somebody, should be more transparent about what's that, going on. That's my point. Uh, FINRA absolutely. was not transparent yeah. about it in any way, which is where a, a lot of these theories then end up flourishing. But beyond that, some, if, if there is a window that people thought was two days longer, somebody should be liable for that change. Absolutely. And, and that I, should you know, be the investor. No, I honestly think that this should that that there's a lot here that the issuer and the executives and the issuer should have done differently. And for some reason, they're not being held accountable. And fin the people are pointing the finger at Finra when because they think Finra changed some dates when when that's not how this any of this works. But then suddenly Finra was subjected to lawsuits right off the bat when this went down. And so I think Finra can't come out and talk about it because now they're in the midst of, you know, this this litigation. But it it it, it it's a terrible situation and there is no transparency and it's this OTC. And it's listen, symbol. let's not pretend that Finra is in the business of shutting trades down. No. And so no, when it, something it, this anomalous happens and nobody will give you an explanation and a company that was public that just generated at $12 a share, a shitload of capital flow suddenly shuts it off and nobody can grab that money back anymore. Wouldn't you most naturally go to the fixes in? Oh, I mean, I, I really think, I think FINRA should have been out in front of this. I think they should have been much more clear with what they did. I think people mm -hmm. believe they haven't received shares. If that's true, and, and I have not seen evidence of that, but I, I, I'm not doubting that there might have been naked shorts in the symbol uh, and people might be stuck without shares. If that's true, then this is going to go to court, the courts. There's going to be litigation and it will all come out, right? So eventually... Right. Everyone what would be, be the home. what would be the other explanation for the the failure to deliver then on those sixty five thousand folks? 
Uh, well, I mean, the, the other explanation would be that they actually, you know, they have placeholders from their brokers. Most brokers that they're holding this through do not have this, the capacity to handle private shares. This is a very unusual situation. And what mm -hmm. they need to do is they need to take these shares and directly register them with the transfer agent, something we might talk about later and something we spent a lot of time on yesterday with, with uh, Gary Gensler. But, you know, in, in if they can directly register their shares with the transfer agent, then they will absolutely have their actual shares in this private company. Mm -hmm. If that's, you know, I think the problem is a lot of people thought that they weren't going to get stuck with these shares because they were going to be able to sell them after that date. But again, unfortunately, that's that's just not how it works. And that's not how, you know, right. the, the, the system works. David Dayan, uh, how much of this then points out sort of, sort of the, the general idea of this market is so overly complex and so easily manipulated and taken advantage of on the margins at 1% of the trades doing this or half of the trades, that there's so much skim in the system yeah. that, and, and that simplifying it would be to the detriment of the market makers and all these other folks. I mean, this is memory lane for me. About seven years ago, I did this <laughs> long, long series on, uh, 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 it was a different market maker, it was a market maker called Knight, uh, that was involved in some things in the over-the-counter market. My understanding of MMTLP is that it moved from NASDAQ to the, the new uh, 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 QSIP that, that, that is in the, the, the OTC market. If you go to the website, the yeah, yeah. If you go to the website of the pink sheets, which is like one aspect of the OTC market, mm -hmm. th there's a warning on it that, that essentially, if I can paraphrase, says, whatever you do, don't come anywhere near this market. <laughs> like that's pretty much what it says on there. Right. I mean, my dad took me to the racetrack when I was, I think, 11. And, and I think more of him as a responsible parent than if he introduced me to the OTC market <laughs> you know i mean it, it it's a wild west out there and it has been right. for a long long time but these things absolutely happen i mean you see uh one thing that i saw in that report many many years ago was um you see these fails to deliver and then uh there are stock splits or reverse stock splits where the qsip changes right and so those old fails to deliver can never be uh, 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 reconciled because it's with an old, uh, uh, an old stock essentially. It's, like, it's going juice. metric to, and to. So you have these out. aged fails that right. exist in on somebody's balance sheet, in some market maker's balance sheet, and there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, uh, you know, that's a situation where it, it, who knows what is actually going on there, why they're creating this this uh, massive increase in inventory through these right. aged fails. But uh, but in this case, the fact that the, the, the individuals were not allowed to uh, end up trading a stock that they were previously uh, a, a allowed to do business in. I mean, right. I, I do think I mean, FINRA. Uh, is a self-regulatory organization. There's definitely some things in the past that make me uh, a little skeptical of their, their, you know, I think you should be skeptical, frankly, of their, right. their, their pat answers for this, saying that everything was above board. Um, but and does that I, make I don't you like having to defend FINRA. I mean, don't get me wrong. You know, it's, right, it's right. frustrating. Like they're here to protect the brokers. They, the brokers pay for FINRA. That's where all their money comes from. It's yeah. a very, uh, it's a, a huge conflict of interest. They have. Oh no, they, it's like the commissioner of football. When the commissioner yeah. of football comes out and he, and he makes some sort of standard ruling, uh, and you're like, I think that just sounded like you were just protecting the owners, and ultimately you realize, oh right, because he works for them. That's really yeah, I mean, boss. like, and that's you know, boss. Real quick, back to the new rules, for example, like one of the rule proposals is the best execution rule, and it's not different mm. than Finra's, but it's the SEC taking best X over because up until now, it's been Finra's responsibility to police best X, and as Finra told me that uh, trying to enforce best X is like trying to nail jello to a wall. They haven't right. brought best X cases. They haven't enforced it because it's a very conflicted system where you and have- And none of these the, people the will be fiduciaries. They, they refuse right. to be right. fiduciaries anyway. So, you know, what's the fucking point at some point? But then David, does that make you skeptical when the SEC says they want to start regulating on crypto uh, and, and you've got, you know, talk about the wild west. I mean, there's all kinds of action uh, going on in there and, and an increasing complexity, uh, like we saw with, with FTX that shows, boy, the, we're really on fragile ground when it comes to this type of thing. What's your feeling on 
the SEC making moves into the world of crypto? Well, I think in the last two months, they've been extremely aggressive uh, and they are finally uh, following through on their contention that uh, most, if not all, of the digital assets that are being sold are unregistered securities. And uh, they have said that for a year. They have given the crypto industry more. So than their, their argument is these are securities. These are unregistered securities, which means that uh, the, the crypto firms have not registered them with the FCC, which would give the disclosures to the investors, would right. give other investor protections. And they have given the industry years, frankly, to uh, get into compliance, to, to, to make these things securities uh, and, and, and to do the various paperwork. And the industry has flat said, no, we're not going to do that. And that gives uh, Gensler no choice but to say, OK, well, we're going to go after you. And he's done it. He's done it with uh, Genesis and Gemini. He's done it with uh, Kraken, where he said he, he basically had mm -hmm. them end what is called staking, which is where you leave right. your 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 digital assets in an exchange and you get uh, some sort of payout uh, for that. It's like uh, and, and he's also uh, done this. He said that he's going to. Uh, sue one of the largest uh, stablecoin issuers. Uh, David, is there any the reason that all the USD? is there any reason why all the names of these companies sound like everyone was high when they came up with them? Is there? <laughs> You'd have that some guy from Mendocino County on that. One. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, what uh, What is going on, David? Do you, Do you have any updates? Uh, we had a caller on deck, Mary from Boston. Mary, are you there? Is Mary there? Mary from Boston. Mary, going once. Going yeah. Mary from Boston. Yep. How are you? Hi, I am well. Are... How are you? Oh, Mary, thank you for asking. I'm I'm doing quite well. A little pensive. Uh, uh, you had a question uh, concerning FTX. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. Please. Yeah. So I I first heard about the scandal when you did the online video with you and David. And I think that was right before the congressional hearings, but I feel like I haven't heard a lot about it since in the news. So I was just wondering, where do things stand with that case and with the company as um, as a whole? A uh, few few things, including a really interesting thing that happened today. Uh, uh, you know, so there, uh, the 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 company FTX, uh, which is holding sort of the bankruptcy, managing the bankruptcy, has asked uh, for a lot of money. That has been, you know, littered around, uh, including into the, uh, including into uh, politicians' hands. They're asking for it back, and this is where the FTX story has really turned. It's really turned into a political corruption story. Today's indictment of Sam uh -huh. Bankman Freed. I don't know if you read it, but uh, it lays out a, a massive straw donor scheme, and what that means is that uh, because there are certain limitations. Uh, whether because of reputation or because of actual FEC limits um, uh, on the amount of money that you can give, Sam Bankman Free was giving money to other people to then give to politicians to basically get around the minimal restrictions that there are in, in campaign finance. And uh, they have him dead to rights. If you read this, uh, this lawsuit, uh, they, 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 they Which, have by the way, emails, it takes they have about as yeah, lazy an idiot to get caught yeah. in a campaign <laughs> finance scandal. Like, right. why not just be a normal shithead and start a super PAC? And then you can just funnel like the rest of these guys, tens of millions. It's like when you read about well, this, listen, is, this is the guy how much money has, has Ken Griffin donated oh, to oh, politicians, yeah. tens Hundreds of millions of right. dollars. Yeah. And, and it's unaccounted because it's all company. dark money, right? Exactly. It's dark money and it's unaccounted. But Bankman Freed, in addition to doing dark money stuff, also did stuff that was on the books and did it mm -hmm. completely illegally. And, and the FEC, which is, by the way, split between Democrats and Republicans, which is why they get almost and nothing has done, done nothing ever, nothing. ever. It's, it's designed to fail. If, mm -hmm. if, if they're suing you, right? I mean, if, if they're figuring out the scheme, you, you've right. done something incredibly wrong. I don't even think they're figuring out. Quite frankly, I think he's an easy patsy. I really do. I think Sam Bankman Freed with his whole Chauncey Gardner Act and everything else, they're going to get him on every fraud known to man. And he's going to be the head they put on a pike 
and say, look at what we're doing about the corruption in campaign finance. It's all nonsense and it's all a red herring because the truth is that system is just a giant fucking hose of dark money and unregulated campaign donations from every powerful player from here to so Timbuktu. So you're saying, you're saying he's like the Martin Shkreli of campaign finance. <laughs> yes, that's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what I'm saying. That right. he's a, he's a wonderful, uh, uh, sort of something to put up on your, a notch on your bedpost when it comes right. to that. But the truth is, how can you look us in the eye and say, you're doing something about campaign finance when these hedge fund billionaires and all these other folks are putting tens of millions, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars into our elections with no ramifications. Yeah, it's, all, this it's guy, all legalized bribery, right? And so if you do it exactly, this way, you get you. caught. Exactly. But if you do it this way, oh, fine, yes. no problem. You, know? you don't. Everything's <laughs> fine. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I do think that uh, the FTX debacle did motivate Gensler to finally move from the warnings yeah. about uh, unregistered securities, the mm -hmm. warnings about fraud in the markets, and go to, OK, we're going to go to litigation now. And by the way, he's doing all this without any new regulations, any new legislation that has been put together. We know how to police fraud. It just takes the will. And what we've seen in the last month or two is that will coming from the SEC. And, and don't forget view. the resources that it takes, right? Like I remember when, when all this started and the Southern District of New York came out and they're like, if we were to actually enforce every rule that's broken and deal with every facet of this case, it would consume our entire office, <laughs> right? So these guys, these fraudsters have every resource that they could possibly want and all the best lawyers and the regulators and the you know enforcement divisions are pretty but underpowered. Didn't they, if the if other I can just push, yeah. push back very quickly. Didn't they give the game up a few years ago when they made the decision to no longer prosecute those cases criminally and just go after mm -hmm. fines? 100%. I mean, when you've got yeah, when you've got a yeah. bank that is caught laundering money for drug cartels, yes, and they get a fine. Mm -hmm. You basically they've made billions on that, and and what the government says is, okay, come on, give us. You're, you're you're, Give us you're 3% about, of that. Yeah. And, and then it's the shareholders that. paying the so, fine, yeah. right? So you're, all you're, of talking this... about, you're talking about HSBC who literally created boxes right. of the same size that would fit into the windows in Mexico for right. the drug cartels. I mean, they, they were and, they were and very they got a integrated fine, with And process. they're still doing business. This was the, actually, so, when, when we talked to Gensler yesterday, this was the very last question I posed to him. I said, what does it take to lose your ability to operate as Thank a broker you. dealer. What does Thank what do you have to why do? Why doesn't FINRA revoke licenses? Why don't I don't do understand any of that shit? I don't understand it at all. And I sit on a FINRA committee where I three times a year I meet them and I sometimes yell at them. I give them my thoughts and advice. And I've right. made this exact point at the last meeting too. And I said it, I, I was like, I can't understand how all these broker dealers who manipulate markets, who defraud investors, who, mm -hmm. you know, misrepresent, launder it's money, what, and, no but they problem. don't lose their, their ability to operate. It's mind boggling. How do you think there's any deterrent effect whatsoever? And it's, it's more than their ability to operate. It's their personal freedom. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, we've seen a lack of accountability for uh, fraud, deception, in uh financial markets Thank for you. for going on 30 years i mean ever Thank since you. uh ever since you know lincoln savings and the snl scandal where they put a thousand Correct. bankers in yeah. jail uh right. we we have we have been over since then pretty much uh when we had the largest uh uh collapse uh financial collapse in right. in uh recent history in 2008 so uh we've you know, uh, S SEC has the ability to revoke your license, but they don't have the ability to put you in jail. They have to team up with the DOJ to do that. That's and, right. And so think about so the this resource... is more of a DOJ problem is just as well. And, and the resources that you have to make one of those prosecutions on uh, financial and propriety and get a fine back are pretty much the same resources it would take to get a referral to DOJ and, and, and put that thing through with some real teeth. Put some which people is, in jail for the which crimes. Which is why you only get this in the egregious cases like the Sam Bankman Freeds of the world, right? right. That's right. Uh, easy, but what I have been hearing, what I have been hearing, is that post FTX guy uh, who follows us pretty closely told me yesterday, post FTX, what you really need in these cases is an insider, somebody to talk 
to tell you exactly what was going on inside there and to oh give you God. the document and all that stuff. And we've got Michael Lewis's FTX, next book. It's going to be a guy who flips <laughs> in a crypt. It's going to be crypto. Ball. Funny enough, Michael Lewis was down praising FTX and Sam Bankman Fried at that little shindig he did in the Bahamas. Um, uh, wow. he, he was he, he was like claiming to write a book about uh, uh, Sam. And, and so now he's stumbled on this. Anyway, my point is, since the FTX collapse, we've seen more insiders willing to talk. And that is driving some of the activity here right. um, when you're talking about the SEC. So, you know, that is that is somewhat promising. I mean, the other promising thing is that the banking regulators came out and said they, they, they put a guidance out to the banks that basically said you should be extremely cautious before putting uh, any kind of investment in crypto right now. Um, and, and, and that hives off this problem, which is still a problem. I mean, a lot of investors in it and they're going to get hurt. Uh, but it's probably not going to spread out to the broader banking system. In the and, same way. And that, and, and, and that is, you know, in, unlike what we saw in 2008 when derivatives and, and, uh, from housing uh, uh, related securities sure. did spread Which at out. that point was infected Fannie Mae and Freddie Mae and everybody else. But uh, David right. Dan, American Prospect, Dave Lauer, uh, CEO of Urban Finance, thank you guys both for joining us. We got about 15 minutes left. I'm going to open up the, the phone lines. Did I just say open up the phone lines like I'm on a fucking telethon? Uh, thank you guys very much for uh, for. Again, there's a, a few people who've lined up some calls that want to talk about other stuff, and in our remaining 15 minutes, I want to do that. Anna Marie from Newburgh, New York, you've you've got a little something you wanna you wanna talk about there. What do you got? Hi, John. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? I can. Hi. Hello. You, you're very enthusiastic. Let's. What do you What, what do you think it? Yeah. So um, I'm horrified and intrigued by the recent revelations about Fox News uh, oh. from the Dominion lawsuit. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Dominion um, lawsuit. You're, you're horrified and intrigued. Uh, horrified in that your suspicions were uh, were met or that you didn't know that they were a fraudulent organization, a Trojan horse sent to destroy America from the inside, uh, dividing the country through lies and, and fabrication. <laughs> Horrified that the proof is clear as day. So um, explicit. And yes, that it's yeah. so, it, yeah, it, it's, you know, kind of grossly and egregiously explicit, like it, it's insulting. Um, yes, what they're doing, you know, it's so obvious kind of as yes. you and the law professor talked about on the yes. recent podcast, like That's correct. It, you wouldn't even teach it. It's such an obvious scenario. So I guess I'm wondering, like outside of kind of a legal framework mm -hmm. um, as like regular citizens that consume media and other kinds of corporate media that mm -hmm. might not be quite as transparent you know, and, and may not, you know, have this kind of discovery in yeah. a, a lawsuit. Of well, this listen, nature, man, this, right? like what, CNN. What, what we got, those emails from Fox News is like a Project Veritas wet dream. I mean, these guys go through yeah. uh, a, a five month sting operation to get an associate producer at CNN, a little tipsy to come out and go, I never really liked Donald Trump. And they're <laughs> like, score, this is huge. But the, the truth is, there is no organization like Fox News. It was built explicitly to subvert uh, the institutions in this country. It was built explicitly to lie to the American people, to create a false narrative and a sideways narrative. They would throw Chris Wallace on there every now and again just to give it a patina of respectability. But uh, it is doing exactly what it was designed to do. And I think the only remedy, because nobody is going to take it, is a Game of Thrones situation where uh, whenever uh, you see Fox News, you, you just shout, shame, shame. <laughs> Shame. Yeah, you probably can't see my face right now, but but I was making the the, the shame face and uh, and working it through there. But uh, Anna Marie, thank you for the call, and I appreciate you uh, keeping an eye on them. But boy, did we see that one fucking coming a mile away the uh, uh, the Fox News situation. And the strangest thing to me, and I and I ask you guys out there, is 
to watch now after these revelations, everyone walking around as though the world hasn't changed, as though we know nothing uh, new. And, and pretending as though this is all business as usual and still taking seriously the points that they bring up as though they're not, I mean, for God's sakes, Rupert Murdoch sent an email explicitly stating to the head of Fox News, we have to do whatever we can to help Donald Trump and the Republicans. I, I, I don't understand why we don't just treat them like the Cartoon Network at this point. Uh, but apparently uh, the rest of the media somehow finding themselves too chicken shit to, to make that happen. But Nathan from Providence, Nathan, I'm going to go to Nathan from Providence. I don't know what he wants to talk about, but I like the name Nathan. Nathan was my grandfather's name, Nathan from Providence, and it is my son's name. And so I'm awfully predisposed to liking you, Nathan from Providence, Rhode Island. Oh, well, well. Oh, well, thank you very much. I hope to leave a good impression. So my question is, should Rule 34, or what's known as the filibuster, be blown up? And if so, should we pack the Supreme Court with four justices to 13 and any possible judgeship we possibly can? Look at Nathan jumping on the extra democratic measures uh, uh, to take care of that. Look, uh, as far as the filibuster being abolished, I... Me personally, uh, the pathogen is already in the court tributary. So the toxic uh, nature there, whether it's nine or 13 or whatever you want to stack it with, that will come back and bite you in the ass because uh, the toxicity uh, and the politicization of our court system is already underway. And again, already part of the strategy uh, to create a parallel universe of courts. And, and let me say this, in, in the troubles, and I refer to them now as the troubles, the post 2020 uh, election shenanigans as the troubles. Mm -hmm. I give credit to the court system as much as they'd been manipulated and politicized over the years. They held mm -hmm. the line for democracy in a way that nothing else did in this country. And without them, and what, it, what it showed was how far and ahead they are of the media in this country. If the media is part of that system, that is mm -hmm. our part of the immune system of democracy. Whereas the media would take credulously all these allegations, the court system was the one who said, uh, you know, this is all bullshit, right? So unless you want to go to yeah. jail, I suggest you get out of my courtroom. Uh, so uh, changing the way the courts go, I don't know. Changing the filibuster, I never understood what it was doing there in the first place. And and I would absolutely yeah, say- it's, Yeah, it's just the whole thing with the Oh, coming back to bite us in the ass. I feel like that's going to be the case no matter what we do. We know for a fact Republicans are, oh, have always been willing to mm -hmm. turn everything you know back around us. Like I don't think we should let that fear stop us uh, from listen, getting. The, the Democrats are yeah. not immune to shenanigans. I mean, it, any Jenny, any gerrymandering map that you saw of New York State this year would tell right. you that the Democrats are not afraid to go like. Uh, what if we made this district look like a falafel sandwich and uh, yeah. you know, they, they, whatever they wanted to do. And so bad that the courts actually restricted it and they ended up losing quite a few seats in Congress and probably control the House of Representatives, courtesy of New York Democrats overstepping their mandate and trying to create yeah, something that, uh, ridiculous. Yeah, that's uh, not too good. <laughs> All right, Nathan. Well, thank you so much for uh, uh, for calling in there and being with us. Uh, uh, really appreciate it. And, and take care of that name. I just, it's such a good one. All right. Uh, Stephen from Irving, Texas. Uh, we're we're going to go out there. This, it's so crazy that this is all over the country. Uh, just nuts. Stephen, what are you doing there? Hi. Um, yeah, hi, I'm doing well. Um, all right. I... I don't really have like a political question, but that's okay, Stephen. Of... What's on your mind? Get unburden yourself, my man. Yeah. Um, wow. I can't believe I'm talking to you. Um, well, so mm -hmm. it, during Christmas, um, my mm -hmm. aunt um, knew this. Uh, she told me this girl she knew um, who grew up, um, and mm -hmm. so like she gave me her phone number and. 
we've been talking and um, in January. Um, he's, she's in residency in pharma, uh, as a pharmacist in um She's a Boston pharmacist and, in Boston. Yeah, yeah. And you live in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, I mean, that's one of the difficulties. But yeah, it's her second year um, as right. a, in residency. Yeah. And, and your, so and your question her, is, should you move to Boston and become a pharmacist? <laughs> no, I'm, well, I'm a software engineer, so I have a lot of oh. flexibility um, and I'm, I'm willing to do like a lot um, if she's, if she's the right person, but, um, Steven, yeah, right now. Yeah. Is she, the, is she, is she the right person? Well, that's where the pro that's where, why I called actually. Um, wait for real. Right that's now, why you called. Well, I, I'm going to, I'm going to help you find out if she's the right person. No, no, there's oh. just, um, there's just like, so, so we've been, we went on a date when I flew out to Boston and we hung out. Um, but, and she's been telling me she's been like swamped and right now she's like not able to survive. Um, like she, well, she's like barely taking care of herself right now. I'm in residency. It's just like, it's very different. Re residency and, is the worst. It's the worst. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Plus she, she has a whole pharmacy at her disposal. So I'm sure that's, <laughs> that's not helping. That's not helping. Yeah. Yeah. She's, she's very sweet and kind. And I know she's like being honest when she tells me, like, she told me, I think like right now, um, mm -hmm. she's, she doesn't think she can like be in a relationship, um, mm -hmm. just because of like how demanding it is. And I totally understand. Um, right, right. but like, I, I guess like, I, I want to give her support and like, mm -hmm. because like, I still do care for her. Um, and, that, right. and like, I have, I have been like calling her like once every two weeks and we've been talking and like mm -hmm. just as friends. Um, and I guess like in terms of support, yeah. sometimes like, like with everything she's going through, Steven, is, is your, is your, is your question here? Uh, are you being foolish by pursuing this woman when yeah. she just wants to be friends? And, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to have to give it to you straight from the heart, Steven. Uh, yes. Yeah. And, uh, here, here's okay. what I would suggest you do. Uh, start driving around Irving, Texas and visiting the pharmacies there. You're going to meet a nice, very kind, lovely pharmacist, one who is no longer in residency, who has the time, and you will meet uh, the pharmacist of your dreams within driving distance. And I think that's got to be the way to go, Stephen, because uh, believe her when she's telling you these things. And thank you so much for the call, Stephen. I do, I do appreciate it. Uh, I do think that we may be the only YouTube live stream that has gone from FTX and the market maker rules laid out by Gary Gensler and the SEC to whether or not uh, pharmacy residents are being truthful when they tell you, I'm just not ready for a relationship right now. I think that's one. I think even Dr. Drew would have pulled his groin making a transition like that uh, on, these, on these various things. We've only got a, a few more minutes and uh, can I say this? This is delightful. This whole YouTube live radio shit. Delightful. We're going to change the world. One like is YouTube likes or is that Facebook? One of them's liked. Uh, let's talk to Spartak. Spartak Abra. You're always going to rely on a man. Then. Spartak. You're always going to rely on Spartak. Oh my God! Oh my God, Spartak! What hey, the fuck? what's up? John? I'm trying to talk to you, you Spartak. Are you there? He's got to bounce. Off. I'm so excited you, to see you. Got to turn down your computer, Spartak. And a long time listener. Spartak, you gotta you gotta turn down your For computer. For sure, I will. The bounce right back. There you go, brother. What's your name, Spartak yeah. Abramov? Yeah, Spartak Abramov. Like, can I can I tell you something? If you are not a hitman from Estonia, you are missing your car. <laughs> because that, my brother, hey, is Russian. that's a badass name. It's hard to be a Russian right now, so are you Russian, my friend? Not to worry. It's not the Russian people. It's the it's it's the, your leader is getting a little Peter the Great on everybody. But 
it's it's not yeah. you at all. What what can I do for you, Spartak? Spartak. Where in New York are you from? So that's exactly why I wanted to call because Please. I wanted to take away from the hard topics that you address and lighten the mood, you know, and just ask uh, like a different sort of question that relates to your method of research. Uh, How, yeah, in general, how do you choose the topics to address and how does your team in general go about the research of the particular things? Uh, that is an excellent question. Uh, so here's generally how we do it. Do you know what a whippet is, Spartak? A whippet where you, you huff, let's say a ready whip can. So we'll sit around and we'll do a few of those. And then generally they'll spin me around as many times as they can and point me to a board where we've just written random letters and we'll just spell stuff out. And that's generally, uh, yeah, you're not buying that. I think Spartak is gone. I think he's, he, once he heard whippets, he probably ran down to the bodega, grabbed himself a little something. Uh, actually we got a great research team. What we basically do is come up with uh, what bothers us the most and throw it out there on the board and try and make a little something there. All right. We're going to go to the last question. Here we go. What is this? Last about an hour. Okay. Here we go. Uh, Matt from Roanoke, Virginia, the mystery of Roanoke, Virginia. Matt, are you there? Yes, sir, I am. How are you? I'm um, very well. What's your question there, my friend? Uh, I can't compete with Love Line with John Stewart. But, How uh, fucking crazy was that? I want yeah, to give that boy delightful. a hug. I felt terrible for him. <laughs> he's he's love sick for God's yeah, sake. I, yeah, I know. I thank you. Yeah. You gave him that hard truth. It's good. Uh, you got to um, do what you got to do. I know you <laughs> I know you got to wrap up. You're a national icon. You got things to do. But I'm getting tired of paying attention uh, of everything. And I've been really passionate about politics. I've participated yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot. It's been two decades. And sure. it's just too much anxiety, too much depression. I can't mm-hmm. do anything about Ohio, the train rail. I can't do anything about the earthquake in Syria. Why should I even watch the news? Like I've gotten to this existential crisis where so much of my identity is based off uh, caring about things that are going on Matt, in the world. But it's Matt, yeah. I so appreciate <laughs> where you're coming from, and I've been there a million times. But I got to tell you, Matt, you take yourself a break. You go get yourself a pint of the Hagen Dust, the Tom and Jerry, whatever you want to get, Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> Uh, or or go to a hookah bar, whatever you need to do to clear your mind, to do a little care on yourself, but you don't give up, Matt, because you don't yeah. know what will be the spark that lights the flame that creates the change, incremental or otherwise, yeah. Matt. There are people on the ground working day in and day out tirelessly to bring about one small change. And what I would suggest to you, my friend, is... Fuck national, get local. So forget about yeah. watching the news and get upset about Ohio. Go down to your local food bank and go, hey, man, once a week, you guys need anything? Because I'll be down here to hook you up. And it'll fill your heart mm-hmm. and it'll remind you that you, my friend, can make change yourself in your neighborhood that is relevant and righteous. And, uh, and it will fill your cup, my man. It will mm-hmm. fill it. <laughs> and and I know this existential crisis. I suffer from it myself. Yeah. Fill your cup, my brother. You can do this. <laughs> Tiny victories. Thank you. T- I appreciate yes! it, sir. The quiet activism of living pleasantly. Matt from Roanoke, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, we're going to end. Thank That's you, our sir. show. Thanks to Dave Lauer, CEO of Urban Finance, creator of We the Investors. David Day, an executive editor of the American Prospect. Uh, and thanks to everybody who called in. Check out the problem. New shows starting on March third on apple tv plus and we'll do this again because quite frankly it's fun and easy bye bye